Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Stand up. It's time to give your career an edge. Stand out with a professional diploma from DBS. Stand by for part-time learning that works for you and your ambitions. Choose from over 30 professional diplomas starting this January and February at dbs.ie. DBS. Ambition realized. DBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... E.G. Marshall. He who sleeps in eternal noise is awakened by silence. Silence. As we all know, silence can sometimes be the loudest sound there is. Certainly, it can be the most eloquent. We spend so much time and energy learning to speak, as if it requires neither effort nor wisdom to know when to keep still. I should like you to meet my husband, Lieutenant Everett Summerfield. Your, uh, your husband? Of course. Everett, dear, uh, this is Mr. Walter Owens. Uh, who, who? Everett, Mr. Owens is also an artist. Mrs. Summerfield, who are you talking to? To my husband, of course. Can't you see? No. That's just the trouble. I can't, I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I'm... Mrs. Summerfield, there is no one here. <laughs> mystery drama First Childhood was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Eileen Heckert. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The years go by... We're aware of the breath in our mouths, the feeling in our bones, our image in a glass. Yes, we stumble through a universe of illusion, constantly threatened by quicksands of uncertainty and doubt. Yet, our basic hold on sanity is ourselves. We may know nothing else, but each of us knows who he or she is. Or do we, really? That's too nice a day for all. Join us at a beach on the northeastern coast. A private, secluded place on a day when the brilliant sunlight dances on the sparkling waves and the air crackles. And as the poet might have said, just to be alive is paradise enow. Oh, good. What? Oh, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I startle you? I was, I was busy concentrating on this canvas. I didn't hear anyone coming. That is rather a good thing. Do you really think so? I wouldn't have said so if I didn't. That doesn't mean I like it. Oh, I, I see. It shows promise. Shows promise. Sort of as the kiss of death for an artist. But you're not an artist. Well, why do you say that? You don't have enough paint on your clothes. I uh, know. You see, the, the idea is to get the paint. Canvas either. There's not enough meaningful paint there. Oh, you've smeared pigment in profusion. But so few of those strokes signify anything. You have <laughs> Spoiled. Are you, um, are you a fortune teller? Do you deny it? You're very handsome, you're charming. I'm sure women think you attractive. Men find you likable. You can have anything you want, except 
Except what? Except art. You can't get that for nothing. You have to work for it. Now, what makes... It's obvious. Well, what have you really got against this painting? You don't have to be an artist to paint it. Madame, I intend no disrespect. <laughs> Your uh, sense of color. My hair is white. I was trying to be tactful. Was Rembrandt tactful? I am not Rembrandt. My point exactly. That an opinion should be based on more than prejudice, bias, or emotion. An opinion, hopefully, should have its foundation in fact, in evidence, in the authenticated truth. You sound like a lawyer. <clears throat> well, it so happens that uh, I am a lawyer. Well, then how can you be an artist? I'm a lawyer and an artist. I noticed you listed lawyer first. No, I, I, I'm both. Now, what business is it of yours? And, and what do you know about art, anyhow? Who asked you in the first place? Those are three questions. And the answers are none, nothing, and nobody. And now, sir, if you'll excuse me. Uh, no, uh, madame, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's you who must excuse me. I'm, I, I, I'm not myself. I, I'm under a strain. I had no right to behave so boorishly. Please forgive me. While I may not be an artist, I can at least be a gentleman. You could also be an artist. You think so? Do, do, do you really think so? Oh, I see your problem. You want assurances. Well, I, I'd like to be sure that I could succeed. That's another one of those words. Sure. Yes, but suppose I devote a lifetime of hard work and, and, and I fail. The devotion is your success. <laughs> Madame... You breathe rarefied air. My name is Regina Summerfield. <laughs> How do you do? Uh, I am Walter Owens. Ah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for talking to me, for spending so much of your time with a complete stranger. But you're not a complete stranger, or even an incomplete stranger. Oh, uh, have we met? Yes, I think we have. No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I say this because I'm sure I would never have forgotten. You're how old? Thirty. Yeah. We met, I think, before you were born. Oh, before I was born? Yes, I'm sure of it. Oh, uh, well, um... Well, is that so strange? Yes, frankly. Why? Where do you think you were before you were born? Where do I think I was before... Inside you, there's an essence. Now, something that makes you Walter Owens. Wouldn't you agree? Well, on the face of it, I suppose I would agree. <laughs> Oh, I have to be careful with you, don't I? You have a way with words. Oh, nonsense. I'm just a little old lady, and you're a brilliant lawyer. Yes, we uh, were talking about where I was before I was born. Uh, this uh, unique essence that happens to be me, I think. I didn't say unique essence. There's nothing singular about it. Many people can have the identical sort of essence. I know a man who seemed to have the same essence as you do when he was younger. Oh, Oh, then I remind you of some. Oh, yes. Uh, who? Would... Would you care to dine with us this evening? Uh, well, well, I... Please do. It'll be such a treat for Everett. My husband doesn't go out much. We can talk about art. You can see our place from here. Uh, you see the, uh, the hill that rises up from the beach? That's the house. On top. Oh. It's, it's beautiful. Say you're calm. All right. Ah, Mrs. Marshall. Oh, wait. Don't tell me. You're in room 212. Yeah, uh, 211. <laughs> I'm close. Yes. <laughs> and your name is Mr. Owens. Uh, no, Owens. Oh. Well, at least I was right about it beginning with an O. Yeah. Uh, do I have any mail? No, sir. Ah, so you got your paint set with you. A paint set? Is that what it's called? Uh, y yes, I, I suppose so. Uh, <clears throat> no mail, eh? Uh, could I say something, Mr. Olin? Uh, Owen. Oh, yeah. Well, I remember when you checked in last night, you said you wouldn't be expecting any mail. Now you're hardly here one day, and already you're asking if you got any. Yes, the uh, mail habit's a hard one to break. <laughs> now, that's a great place for painting pictures. Lots of artists come around. And you know what they paint mostly? Tell me. The Summerfield place. You can see it from everywhere on the beach. It's on top of the hill. Yes. Yes, it's a magnificent mansion. Oh, falling apart. Forty, fifty years ago, before the war. I mean, the Second World War. Oh, that 
was a place to see. Well, it's still very imposing. Look close. It's falling apart. A pity you won't get to see the inside of it. She won't let hardly anybody in there. <laughs> but I will get to see the inside. Yeah? Yes, I'm invited there to dinner. Your what? Yes, I met Mrs. Summerfield about an hour ago out at the beach. She spoke to you? Yes, we had quite a talk. Well, if that don't be... So no. I'm dining tonight with the Summerfields. The, uh, Summerfields? Yes, Mrs. Summerfield and her husband. I believe his name is, uh, Everett. Uh, yeah, well, uh... What's the matter, Mrs. Marsha? Look, what you have to understand is that there is no Mr. Everett Summerfield. No Mr... <laughs> what are you saying? I'm saying that there isn't any Mr. Everett Summerfield. There isn't? No, sir, there isn't. And... She simply won't accept that. Uh-huh. Well, what happened? Well, you see, Everett Summerfield was in the Navy. He he was a lieutenant on board the USS Arizona, which was at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And the ship was blown up on December 7th and sank to the bottom. And he was killed? Yeah, he was killed. But you see, they never did find his body. I see. Now, she pretends he's come back. She talks to him. Just as if he's sitting there, and she she cocks her head as, as if she's listening to him. I swear, it is scary. Yeah, it's quite a place, but uh, she's not going to be able to keep it much longer. Well, why do you say that? Well, because she's got a relative, some niece or something, that's trying to get the place away from her. Well, on what grounds? On what grounds? Well, the woman's a nut. I mean, I, I like her personally, but... She is a prime candidate for the nut house. Uh, look, you, you're going there tonight. Okay. You'll see for yourself. I mean, the, the, the curtains on the windows are red. The upholstery's all worn out on the furniture. The place needs paint all over. But she thinks... You know what she thinks. What? She thinks the place is in shape for the, for the President of the United States to be entertained in. What you're intimating is... She's crazy. Intimating. It's a fact. Mr. Owens, it's a hard, cold, cruel fact. Ah, Mr. Owens. Good evening, Mrs. Summerfield. Do, do come here. Yeah, I brought you this. Oh, you shouldn't have. It's a favorite dinner wine of mine. Wine of mine. That sounds so pretty. I'm sure Everett will enjoy it. Perhaps it will help him sleep. Poor Everett, he's been out of sorts lately. I'm sure you must be starved. Oh, no, we're not a... I whipped up... Uh, that's a modern term, but so descriptive. I whipped up dinner myself. We let the servants go. Well, why keep them? We don't use all the house these days. Just a small part of it, and it's enough for the two of us. Uh, this is Everett's library, but he'll want to show it to you himself. And this is a small room that we use as a combined sitting and dining salon. Lovely, isn't it? It's, uh, uh yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, these are genuine heffel whites. The drape on the window, if you look uh, a bit more closely, is a genuine gobelin. That is, it's purported to be. But this is Limoges, China. Ah, uh, I see. The tablecloth is a type of pure linen that doesn't seem to be made anymore. It was the exclusive secret of an old family in Ireland, which is now extinct, I understand. But you can see the fine weave, can't you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and this cup is quite small, you see. Oh, so exquisite. It's a Cellini. Oh, beautiful. Please forgive me. Uh, for what? Oh, I babble on and on about all these lovely things. It suddenly seems to me I must sound like a Philistine. Don't you think No, no, so? no, not at all. Why do you say that? <laughs> Listen how I emphasize this as a genuine that. Cellini, Gobelin, Limoges. I'm trying to impress you with names. <laughs> that doesn't seem that way. Oh, and how rare and expensive those things are. Well, it's true. They do happen to be. <laughs> but I shouldn't brag about it. I can't help it. I was very poor. I never knew my mother, my father, 
was the town drunk. Oh. Lovable man, but he had the sickness. He couldn't support himself, let alone me. And so I ate the bread of charity all during my childhood. It's a bitter, hard loaf. I never had a new dress or doll or toy. I was determined I would have money. When I was old enough to work, I was a maid to some wealthy summer people. Uh, They were big bankers and brokers from Wall Street. When I entered the room, they didn't stop talking. I mean, they never even noticed me. Well, why should they? Do you know how I became rich? Can you guess? Uh, well, no. By listening to their conversation. What do you want to do about consolidated engines, Jim? Why don't we buy Northmont Steel? She'll surely go up ten points. And so on. And I bought two. I put my pennies together. I bought what they did. Sold when they did. And soon I had money. A great deal of money. Mm. Oh, excuse me. We'll talk about it later. Here's Everett now. Uh, uh, Everett? Good evening, Everett, darling. We have a guest for dinner, Mr. Walter Owen. I don't know. I didn't ask him. Are you, Mr. Owen? Am I what? Are you from New York? Oh, uh, no. Uh, Philadelphia. Everett. Why do you think everybody's from New York? Well, shall we all be seated? No. No, I'll carve the roast, Everett. You're always complaining about the knife. Yes, dear. Mr. Owens, in order to maintain domestic tranquility, will you do the honors and carve? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, I suppose so. And just who is Mrs. Summerfield? When we first met her, she seemed like a rather sharp, smart, with it old lady. Everett is obviously supposed to be Lieutenant Everett Summerfield, who was killed many years ago at Pearl Harbor. What is he doing having dinner here tonight? Or is he? Things will either get clearer or cloudier when I return shortly with Act Two. With Lucky Landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. from the sea, said the poet. But some sailors can never come home again. They lie buried forever under a watery grave of warm green or cold blue. Lieutenant Everett Summerfield went down with his ship at Pearl Harbor on that terrible day. But not according to his wife, who is now having dinner with him many years later. I hope you enjoyed your dinner, Mr. Owen. Oh, yes, yes. Excellent. Some more coffee. No, no, thank you. This is fine. Just fine. Everett. Everett. Oh, my goodness. Look at him and listen to him. He's fast asleep. Honestly, Mr. Owens, that man can go off just anywhere. Or was it your wine? I just wish he wouldn't snore so loudly. Does it disturb you? Uh, d- does does what disturb me? Well, can't you hear that man snore? Oh, I, I don't mind. You're very kind. I was telling you how I became so rich by just listening to wealthy men talk. I was 19 years old, and I had almost half a million dollars. Can you believe it? Yes, I could believe it. I couldn't. But there it was in my account in my broker's office in New York. Meanwhile, I'd I'd fallen in love. Can you guess with whom? Everett. Yes, Everett. Everett Summerfield. It was a miracle. What do you mean? A miracle that he would fall in love with me. Why? Well, why shouldn't I fall in love with him? He was tall and handsome and rich. But for him to love me, mousy little Regina Melson, a a penniless orphan girl. Yes, but but you were rich. But who knew that? No one, not yet. 
I was Miss Nobody who had nothing. And yet he fell in love with me. His parents were furious. And then they died. An automobile accident. And do you know what came out? Mr. Summerfield Sr. was broke. It was a disaster. Do you know what really bothered Everett? The thought that he might have to lose this house. This magnificent home. He always loved it. Well, you can see why. Oh, yes, yes, I can. You can't imagine what happened when I said to him, Darling, here's enough money to save the house. <laughs> and we saved it. We were very happy until the war clouds began to threaten. Everett had a commission in the naval reserve. He volunteered for active duty. Was, uh, was he at Pearl Harbor? Oh, yes, yes. Um, wasn't there a report that he had gone down with his ship? Oh, you must have been listening to some of the town talk. Is that what you heard? Uh, yes, uh, I believe so. It was many years ago. I received a wire from the War Department. They said he was killed in action. But you know, I refused to believe it. You refused? But why? Because I knew it couldn't be true. He couldn't be dead. He just couldn't be. And so I was not going to believe it. I went to Hawaii to look for him. But, but if he was reported killed in action, where could you look? <laughs> Under the sea? Well, there's no point in looking there. If he were there, he'd be dead, wouldn't he? No, I thought perhaps he'd been wounded, lost his identification. Or he might have been suffering from amnesia. He could have been wandering around the island. I just knew I had to look. Well, did you ask the War Department for assistance? According to the War Department, my effort was dead. They wrote me a letter to that effect. Now, ask me what I wrote back to them. Well, what did you write? I wrote, if Everett Summerfield is dead, show me the body. They couldn't. And that's how I knew Everett must still be alive, and I was right. What makes you say that? Well, I was right, wasn't I? Here he is today. Uh Uh-huh. But the truth is, I didn't find him. You didn't? No. In the end, he found me. I came home, I waited. I knew he'd return to the place he loved best, the person he loved best. He did. One day, one lovely summer's day, he walked into the house. I'll never leave this place again, he said. I'll never leave you again. He hasn't. How nice. Are you perhaps wondering why I stopped to talk to you this morning? Why did you? I spoke to you about an essence that forms the core of each of us, remember? I remember. It reminded me of what was inside Everett before he went away to war. I didn't want to see you waste yours the way his was wasted. Everett wanted to be a painter, too. He was afraid he wasn't good enough, just as you are. Yes, it's something to be afraid of. Why? Well, because if it should turn out that one is not good enough, what has one done with one's life? Lift it. But I know I'm a good lawyer. Then why aren't you happy? I'm very happy. Well, I was very happy, as a matter of fact, until I met you this morning. Oh, I am sorry. Well, you see, every so often, uh, I take some time off. I go somewhere and just paint furiously for a week or so. Well, I have to get it out of my system. Can you ever really get it out of your system? <sighs> well, it's getting late. Thank you for a fine dinner. Everett and I are glad you could come. There's no point in trying to wake him. He'll get up in his own time. I'll say good night for him. Yes, uh, uh, good night. And please come again soon. Well, hello there, Mr. Owen. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Marshak. Uh, I'd rather you call me Dell. I can't get used to this, uh, Mrs. Marshak. I only been married to him a week. Yes, sir. Uh, were, were there any calls for me? Uh, now look, you said you weren't expecting any mail or calls or anything. Yes, well, actually, I'm not. Well, uh, how was uh, dinner at, at the castle? Oh, uh, quite an experience. Does she still have any furniture left? You know, it's very sad. Hmm? She thinks she's surrounded by priceless antiques and works of art. That's pitiful. <laughs> and yet she's such a bright lady. It's love. She just could never get over him. It must be terrible to be in love like that. I could never be. Never. Well, that'll come to an end maybe by next week. Why next week? 
Well, I was telling you about this niece. There's going to be a hearing in court. A hearing? When? Mm, I guess the day after tomorrow. Judge Sterling is in town. He's staying here at the motel. J- Judge Donald F. Sterling? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. He, he comes from around here. Do you know him? Well, where is he? Well, I saw him go into supper. Uh, excuse me, dinner. He should still be in the dining room. Judge, Judge Sterling. Walter, had your dinner? Uh, yes, sir, yes, well, sir. Sit down, have some coffee. Thank you, thank you, Judge. Uh, what are you doing up here? Oh, just a little vacation. Uh, here, young lawyers, get all the breaks. I'm working. This place is part of my circuit. I've got what I call a COL. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's my own private code for a crazy old lady. Oh. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's just that I hate these things. You get some greedy, shifty-eyed relative who wants the old gal put away for her own good, naturally. Mm, naturally. And the truth is, the old gal would be better off being taken care of, but it's a messy situation. Well, anyhow, since I'll have to adjudicate this case, I'd better not discuss it. Uh, yes, sir. Ah. Uh, the vultures have circled and landed. Uh, what's that, sir? That table near the window. Yes. That young lady, or uh, should I say woman, that's the cousin. Somewhat distant cousin. But the only surviving legal relative of the late Everett Summerfield. The late? Yes. That's what this thing's all about. And her estimable attorney, Mr. Leroy Pillow. Mm, an appetizing duo. But they may have the evidence on their side. Oh, what evidence? Enough to show that Regina should be committed. You call her Regina. It sounds as if you know her. Yes, I've known her all my life. Well, first part of my life, anyhow. A little orphan girl. Work-worn little drudge before she was fairly into her teens. Her face and hands were always dirty. Heaven forgive us, we all made fun of her. All of us, little rich kids. Uh, Judge, you say there's to be a hearing. Yes, the day after tomorrow. Does, um, does Mrs. Summerfield have a lawyer? There's no one of record as yet. I suppose the court will have to appoint one. Uh, do you suppose the courts could appoint me? I would like to represent Mrs. Summerfield. Uh, you, uh, know what that means? Uh, yes. Yes, it means that I've taken on a very difficult case. Mr. Owen. Yes, I, I know it's late. Uh, m- may I come in? Of course. Is something wrong, Mr. Owen? Uh, Mrs. Summerfield, did you know that the day after tomorrow you are being taken to court? Yes, I've been told to appear. Do you know why you've been told to appear? I suppose it's that Marston woman. Yes, well, that Marston woman, as you call her, is out to have you committed to a mental institution. On what grounds? On the grounds that your... Uh, That your faculties are impaired. In other words, I'm crazy. Well, I was only trying to say nicely. Uh, Mrs. Summerfield, uh, please, let let, let me explain. A pity you just missed Everett. He was quite taken with you. He he went upstairs to bed. Mrs. Summerfield, we must talk about Everett. Oh, I'm delighted. I love to talk about Everett. Uh, Well, first, let me tell you, as your attorney... Oh, are you my attorney? Yeah, I was just appointed by the court. Ma. Now, I need have no further worries. Not that I ever had any. Judge Sterling, I've known him since we were both children. Uh, Judge Sterling is not so sure that he will be able to prevent that Marston woman from from winning the case. Judge Sterling is an honorable man. He would never permit justice to be mocked in his courtroom. He may have no choice on the basis of the evidence. What evidence? Well, um... Yes, Mr. Owen. This, uh, insistence of yours that... That Everett is in the house. I mean, you see... That, that will w- be quite enough, Mr. Owen. I see I have misjudged Mrs. you. Mrs. Summerfield... Are you telling me that Everett is not in the house? As your lawyer, I can... If only... that is your attitude, you can no longer be my lawyer. Please, Mrs. Summerfield... I must ask you to leave. We'll all have to leave for a few moments until the arrival of Act Three. But what have we here? Evidently a tug of war between fact and fancy. 
which side usually wins these affairs? Now think a moment before you answer. We'll continue shortly. Cogito ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am, said the philosopher. Now, if you examine that, you see it's absolutely right. If you can think, it's proof you have to be. But that's only you. If you think for someone else, does that mean that they are also there? Once again, we discover that we should never get bogged down with philosophy when we're trying to tell a story. Onward. Mrs. Summerfield, I want to help you. How? I want you to be able to stay here, to live here. I mean, after all, this is your own home. And? And you know that Marston woman's attorney will charge that you are no longer competent. Let it. Now, I have seen these things in court. Have you? Older people can easily be victimized. Will my lawyer stand idly by and permit it? Your lawyer can only deal with facts. Oh, we're back to that. One fact your lawyer will find difficult, if not impossible to overcome, is that you talk to people who aren't here. Everett is here. Uh, let, let me put it this way. You talk to people who cannot be seen. Is it my fault if others cannot see clearly, truly? Yet that's neither here nor there. Don't say that. Realistically, everything has to be in one place or the other. Yes, well, that is your best defense. Now, I will place you on the stand. Oh, that must be an exciting experience. I've seen it on the stage and in the motion pictures. It's never happened to me. Yes, well, well, I will ask you the following question. I'll be under oath, won't I? Yes, yes. Now, I will say, Mrs. Summerfield, do you actually believe your husband is still alive? And I will answer yes. You will answer no. How can I answer no? You just told me I was under oath. Because the answer is no, and the case will be dismissed. The answer must be yes, because Everett is alive. Our second best defense... I will ask the same question. Mrs. Summerfield, do you actually believe your husband is still alive? And I will answer yes. You will answer, I want him to be alive, and I try very hard to believe it. But I don't try hard to believe it. It happens to be true. The attorney for that Marston woman will ask you that question. What will you answer? Yes. That answer opens the asylum doors. It's the truth, Walter. I wish you believe it. Well, it's very hard to believe it. Of course. Now, you've just caught the exact sense of it. If it were easy to believe, well, there'd be no problem, would there? And that's the same with everything else. If it were easy to be an artist, anyone could do it. Mrs. Summerfield, please let us stay on the subject. This is the subject. Do you do what's in your heart or do you do what's easy? It's easy for you to be a lawyer, but it's right for you to be a painter. Mrs. Summerfield, when I talk to you, sometimes I no longer know what I mean. Then there's hope for you. Uh, probably. But is there hope for you? Good evening, Mrs. Marsha. I'd rather you call me Belle. Good night, Belle. See you in the morning. Uh, aren't you going to ask me your usual question? Well, what usual question? Any mail? Any messages? Well, I never have any. Well, you do tonight. A message from uh, a Mr. Pillow. He's the lawyer you're going to be up against in court. Well, how do you know I'm going to be in court? I know everything. He'd like to see you in the lounge. Walter Owen? Uh, yes. A pillow's the name. Leroy Pillow. This is Meister. Julia Meister. How do you do? How do you do? The name goes against the character, Miss Marston. In what way? It seems to me that Julia is usually the heroic role of a melodrama, not the villainous. Now, wait a minute. See here, Mr. Owen. Oh, calm off at me, Roy. Uh, get to the point. Well, what is the point? Well, the fact is you probably think I'm trying to swindle some bally old dame out of her estate. <laughs> you made that statement, Miss Marston. Oh, well, she's crazy. Do you deny it? I'm listening, Miss Marston. She can't take care of herself. The place is falling into rack and ruin. Rack and ruin? Did you make that up? It can be saved. It can make a fantastic resort hotel. Yes, think of what a boon it would be to the economy of this town. So, uh, tell me your proposition, Leroy. 
Uh, Mr. Owens, why can't we settle this out of court? I settle what? Yeah, problem. Well, I'm not aware of a problem. Can't you convince your client that it's in her best interest? No, no, uh, I'm afraid not. Look, I'm not trying to swindle her out of the property. No, no. But it'll still be hers. In name, at least. And she'll be away in a nice place with, with nice little old ladies just like herself. And she can dig in a nice little garden. Yeah, what a lovely prospect. Oh, and I'm trying to help you out. Are you? Why lose a case when you don't have to? Who says I have to? Your Honor, we have one of those unfortunate cases that occur far too often in our society. A human being reaches an age where she can no longer function fully. No objection, Your Honor. Mrs. Summerfield's ability to function is what is at issue here. Sustain. Counselor, you've been quite a while with your introduction. Now may we get on with it. How we doing? Oh, badly. Our faith. Yes, I might as well. I don't have anything else. Uh, Your Honor, we call as a witness Mrs. Bell Marshak. Mrs. Marshak, will you come up, please? Yes, sir. I will. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Uh, Miss Marshak, how long have you known Mrs. Summerfield? All my life. You know her well, then. Um, yes. Would you say that there is something, uh... Peculiar about her? Meaning what, sir? Or does she do anything that might be considered strange? The objection, Your Honor. If each of us were permitted to define strange, and that were to be used as a legal guideline, who would be kept out of the asylum? Now, let him make his point, Mr. Owens, and then I'll rule on it. Now, thank you, Your Honor. And Mrs. Marshak, is it strange to insist that a dead man actually exists? Well, yeah. Um, Does Mrs. Summerfield, to your knowledge, claim that her husband is alive? Uh, yes. Isn't it a fact that on more than one occasion she has actually addressed him as if he was actually there? Yes. yes. And in your presence, didn't she actually insist that he was talking to her? Didn't she even answer him? Uh, yes. I have no further questions. Well, Walter? What can I tell you? It's not good at all. But Sterling is an old friend. Sterling is first a judge. Cheer up. Justice triumphs in the end. Who told you that? It's supposed to. Yes. There's been a profession, a cavalcade of witnesses out there all testifying that you live in a in a, in a never never land, a make believe world. Oh, I'm very much afraid. You're always afraid of the odds, aren't you, Walter? But they'll always be against you. Always. No matter what you want to do. That is, if you want to do it right. Yes. Well, it's time we got back into the court, then. Become a painter. Give up the law. <laughs> After I lose this case, I may have to. In essence, Miss Marston, why have you brought this action? Because I'm trying to salvage something. Mr. Summerfield is no longer able to maintain the house. As everyone has testified, it's going to rack and ruin. I would like to set the place to rent. And have you discussed it with Mrs. Summerfield? Well, how can you talk to her? She lives in another world. Everybody knows that. She even thinks her husband is alive. No objection, Your Honor. I uh, go what, Mr. Owen? The issue of her husband's death is still before the court. Yes, but the court has as Exhibit A this document from the United States Navy that informs us Lieutenant Everett Summerfield died in action. Uh, Lieutenant Summerfield's body was never recovered, Your Honor. We can therefore never be sure that the Navy is correct. Uh, I see. Is this to be your line of argument? Well, it's uh, one line of argument. Uh, yes, well, I'll weigh it with the rest. I continue with your testimony, Miss Marsden. You go into that house and 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 you were spooked. What other word can I use? Spooked. The, the joint is just falling apart. And you talk to her. You know what? It's like talking to someone in their second childhood. Does 
the whole story. Virginia Summerfield is in our second childhood. Your Honor, I object. Regina, you can't object. Why not? Except to your attorney. Oh, him. He knows more about painting than he does about the law. Besides, anyone has a right to object when they hear a lie. What lie? This young lady has just told a lie. She said I was in my second childhood. That's not true. I'm in my first. Uh, well, now... You he knows that better than you, Jeremy Sterling. Did I ever have a childhood? You can answer that question because you had one. We're both the same age, you and I. We were both raised in this town. And while you were having your childhood, what, what was I having? What, Jeremy? I was having doors to scrub, dishes to wash clothes, to launder. I had a little cot behind the stove in some rich lady's kitchen. I ate what was left over. I wore what was handed down. I lived alone without friends. Sometimes. I was so desperate to hear the voices of children that I thought you out. Well, you were all playing in your pretty clothes with your your beautiful toys. I knew you didn't even make fun of me, but that was all right. At least someone was paying attention to me. Maybe you threw mud pies at me. But did the dirt ever show on my dress? Did it, Jeremy? Did it? No. So... I didn't have a childhood. You know what childhood is, Jeremy. You don't because you had one. Well, I'll tell you. Childhood is a time of of dreams and illusions and, and fairy tales. And you have to have it. You simply have to have it. Or else there can't be any meaning to your life. And since I didn't have mine when I was young... I have to have it now, before it's too late. Childhood means living in your own beautiful world. And I claim my beautiful world now. Is it too much to ask, Jeremy? The case is dismissed. <laughs> The beautiful world of childhood, the world of innocence, the world of infinite possibility and unlimited promise. So the things we dreamed would one day happen. The adventures we would know, the people we would become. It's too bad most of those dreams never come true. Or do they? I shall return shortly. Childhood, childhood, sings the poet. Wonderful girl and boy land. Once you leave its portals, you can never return again. Maybe that's not true either. Certainly so many of us strive to go back to the simplicity, the wonder of it. But the trouble is, childhood is so rare and so precious that usually they can only spare one to a customer. Our cast included Eileen Hetrick, Paul Hecht, Bryna Rabin, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Don't take another step. You don't want to use... You can put down your rifle, Captain. We mean no harm. But what do you two want? I think you know. We want our brother's body. Let us take it. You say nothing. Well... We're here to get Paul's body. To take him off your land and give him a decent burial. And where would that be? Where he belongs. Six feet under carpenter soil, is that it? Yes, Captain. That's it. You are out of your mind, girl. What is that supposed to mean? Well, just turn around, the two of you. And take yourself straight back to where you come from. But please, Captain Crane. We are not about to do that. We want our brother's body. And we are here to get it. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater 
for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.